you don't have to wash your hands. I have so much time to myself. Hey, walk away when I'm talking to you. My kids really respect my privacy. When this timer goes off, please turn it off and do not tell me. Thanks. Here, can you use up all my battery? Don't call me when you get there. I don't want to know where you are. It is just too quiet in this car. Okay, we're about to leave for church, so if you're gonna make a huge mess, you better do it now. I don't know, your dad usually does everything around here. All of these people are such good drivers. Eating dinner is completely optional. Hanging up your towel is completely optional. Flushing the toilet is completely optional. Okay, this time, can you smile more like a crazed lunatic? Hey, you wanna dig through the fridge for the fifth time today? I'd definitely rather be here than at the beach. I am loving the look of these chips on the floor. I am loving the smell of your feet in my face. I am loving this back pain. Get a massage, ew, no thanks. Take anything you want from my closet and don't worry about putting it back. Don't look at the camera, look over there. If your sister takes your toy, just give her a good smack on the head. Hey, come drink that grape juice in here on the carpet. It's dinner time, everybody come get a snack. Hey, did you know you can wear the same pair of underwear all week long? Yeah, that's exciting to know. <laughs> so how many of you really have heard some of those things from your moms? Usually in a sarcastic tone, but yeah. Oh, let's hear from the moms. Yes. Woohoo. Yeah, okay. One of one of them. Let me just uh, take a moment, though, uh, with the celebratory jubilation, um, just to take a note, a little serious tone here, too. As with a lot of things, things can be both joyful and um, painful. And so I want to acknowledge uh, uh, you ladies who. Uh, may not find this day as uh, happy as, um, as others find it through past decisions, through uh, uh, not being able to be a mom, through uh, estrangements, through just hurts and, and pain and loss. We love you. We acknowledge you. It's not always easy to, uh, to be around all the joy when you're hurting inside. And um, that's the, the uniqueness of life. There's so many good things and there's so many difficult things in life and, and together <clears throat> it gives us uh, what we have, right? So we want to acknowledge you and honor all, all of you and just uh, tell you that we love you. Grace and peace to you for sure. Um, today we're talking about <clears throat> um, the word please. That's, that's the, the title of the sermon. Um, it's not that you need to say please and thank you, that your moms would tell us, right? Uh, but it's uh, just a reminder of how to please the Lord. And so uh, it got me thinking about things. Um, God doesn't force his way on us. Um, he, he doesn't um, uh, tell us that we have to follow him. It's really this uh, love relationship. Uh, Jesus sort of, he addressed this. When he, uh, when he was talking in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he said, uh, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or despise the other. You will be devoted to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Uh, you could say you could not serve God and whatever. You could fill in the blank. There's a loyalty in that, that this idea of seeking to please God. And um, I love this quote from St. Augustine, uh, you are what you love. Uh, you are what you love. We tend to focus on those things that we love. We give a lot of attention to it, time and money and energies. And, um, and, and also, you become what you aim to please. And so uh, the idea of this sermon is uh, just looking at life and saying that I want to please the one that I love, God. Now, we're in a series here uh, right now. Paul and I are working through a series. I've got the first couple set, um, messages in this series <clears throat> called Rooted, and it's a study of Colossians. And uh, we'll be working through uh, little sections of, of this uh, series. There are, um, uh, this, this sermon, in fact, is the beginning of, of uh, Paul's prayer. He's, he's written this letter to uh, a church in 
Colossae. It's a, it's a church in um, uh, Asia Minor, what we would consider Turkey today. Uh, and um, this is a church, a, 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 a believing uh, community that Paul did not start, has never visited. So this is sort of a, just sort of a cold letter in, a, in effect. But he had learned about these uh, believers who are in this town from a fellow named Epaphras. And Epaphras has given a report uh, to Paul. They're doing great. They're doing wonderfully. It's a young, young congregation. But he's also got some concerns. And that's what's prompted Paul to write this letter. So this, today's sermon is, um, is the beginning of, uh, of a sort of a longer prayer that Paul is praying that, that we'll look at over the next couple uh, messages that, that, um, that I and Paul will be uh, preaching through. So we're going to focus in on, on this one today. I do want to say this. This church is made up primarily of Gentile Christians, and that'll mean a lot here in just a little bit. Of course, a Gentile, churchy words here, or Bible words, a Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew, right? So this is an important thing to keep in mind. This is a Gentile congregation, and uh, Paul is addressing these folks and helping this. It'll make a lot more sense later today, but it'll also, as we continue on uh, through our study here, and we got to keep that in mind because that really gives a lot of tenor and uh, background to uh, what the message is, or what the message of Paul is. So let's dive in here. Uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 9. Uh, this is what uh, as Paul has written. Uh, starting at verse 9, it says this, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sin, please. May we live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. That's really the heartbeat of what this is about. So let's dive into this and sort of break some things down as we sort of dive into what Paul's um, praying about. It starts off, verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. And like with anything, whenever you have a for this reason, it's sort of like the therefore, what, you know, if you got a therefore in the Bible or anytime, you know, if you got a therefore, you got to make sure you know what it's there for, right? So there's always something leading up to this. So for this reason, we need to back up just a little bit and get a little bit of a running start from what I read. So let me background or back, back up just to verse six. And this is what Paul said earlier before he gets to the for this reason. In the same way, Paul writes, he says, The gospel or the kingdom of heaven is available to you all. The kingdom of God is here, right? And the king is here. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. That's key, right? I mean, for me, when I understood God's grace, that was was the light. That was the switch that caused the light to go off on my mind. He says, you learned it from, from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ and on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. But Epaphras is the guy who um, planted this church, we think. Um, he is there ministering them. He's probably with Paul right now, had visited Paul in prison, who is in Rome, and um, has been giving him this report and telling him about these, these, uh, these believers. And so we have this, uh, for this reason... Since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. Um, Paul has been prompted to pray for uh, these um, disciples because of Epaphras' um, uh, um, message and telling them about these people, probably listing them by name because Paul, he does, he loves names and, and he'll, he'll sort of address that at the very, very last sermon. Um, but he, he, uh, he's praying for these people by name and, is, and encouraging them and, and wanting them to be able to remain faithful, to remain rooted and uh, this is the cause for this, for this message, for, this, uh, for the, his, his letter that he's writing. And so the question then is, what is the focus of this prayer? What's the core idea of this prayer? And we've already looked at it, but he says, uh, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will 
through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way. So Paul wants these Colossians, these folks he's never met, never been to this, this, this people, of this church, a gathering, um, and he wants them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will through wisdom and understanding. Now these three words are, are pretty <laughs> pretty popular, pretty paramount in really throughout all the scriptures. To know God, to knowledge. We, gotta, we have to know. We have to know things to be able to, to act differently, right? Wisdom is uh, one of those words that is, uh, it's not exact. I mean, typically wisdom comes from sometimes making mistakes, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, 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 you go through life, you end up gaining a lot of wisdom. Um, we sometimes like to pass on wisdom to other people, which usually in the forms of, don't do it this way, that's what I did, right? That's usually wisdom. Uh, it didn't work out well for me, I've lived it, right? So this idea, and this other idea of understanding, knowledge and wisdom and understanding, they lead to a life well lived. And we can see Paul's heart for churches, for uh, for, for these body believers, he he's started many, many churches, started many, many uh, gatherings, many communities of faith uh, throughout uh, the Roman world, his world, and, um, and helped them to become kingdom communities. Now, there's two basic kinds of, of God's will that I want, want to sort of look at and try to figure out what, what, what do you think Paul's looking at here? What, what, is he, what is he addressing? He says, we, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. There's two different kinds of will. One is sort of a specific, a specific will that God has a very specific plan for each individual human being. He has a calling on each of us that we must discover. He's selected spouses and places to live and jobs to get and how many children to have, if any, right? So that's a specific will. And, and I'm, I think there's a lot more openness to that. That's just my opinion, um, I, I think sometimes we pray for specifics because we want specifics. It's, it's difficult because life is hard. We want to know what's going to come. God, give us an idea. Help us to know what's going to happen. What's going to happen. Life is spelled, I know I've mentioned this before, life is spelled R-I-S-K. I mean, that's just how it's spelled. It's, it's difficult. It's challenging. We want to know what's going to, and Paul's not really addressing specific will, if however that would be addressed. He's really looking at the bigger picture from God's plan from creation to kingdom. God's, God's plan from creation to through Abraham and through Moses and David and down through the announcement of the kingdom of God and how God is including these Gentile believers into the family. We'll talk about that next week. We know that God wants all to be disciples, to all be saved, to be set apart, to live in submission, serve humanity, obeying God. We know that God's will in a general sense, we know that they, he wants us to share faith, sexual purity, and to love enemies and use gifts, our gifts, our talents, our skills for kingdom work, to be filled with the Spirit. We know, we know those. I mean, in fact, I'd probably say we know 95% of what God wants of humans, of how to live a life. And sometimes we struggle with that. That's the kind of picture that Paul is praying. He's praying that, that these Gentile believers would know the big picture of God. That they would see his, his work at including them, these Gentile believers, into the family. To know God's will... We have, one, we have Psalm 143.10, just a couple passages here that talks about God's will. It says, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. In Matthew 6, you've prayed this probably, the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus was responding to the disciples saying, teach us to pray. And he says, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, may what God wants, may it become a reality where we live. And that's part of being in this kingdom. That's part of being a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus. It's part of what it means to be here, to be among others, that we may bring God's will, his goodness, and love and mercy to all mankind. That's, that's part of what God's will is. And then we have 
uh, a passage that I'm sure you're familiar with, probably if you've been in the church very much, when Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, as Jesus was hanging out at the Wisconsin Dells, if you remember that from last week, in Galilee, and he would travel down through Samaria or Illinois, right? Um, uh, there was a place called Sychar. Uh, Jacob's well was there, there, a very familiar place uh, in the Old Testament. And there he encountered a woman who, um, who was, um, had a bad reputation. Okay, we'll say it that way. She, she had a bad reputation. She was in, living in shame with uh, people of her community. But when she encountered Jesus, man, that was all gone. The disciples left Jesus and this uh, woman speaking at this well at high noon, and they went off to McDonald's to get some food and came back, and they said, Jesus, here's some food. And Jesus responds, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Now, it didn't mean that Jesus didn't eat, didn't use the bathroom, didn't walk. He was fully God, fully human. It's just he was trying to make a point that said, Man, what I feast on is doing what God wants. God's will, right? So what Paul is saying, we, we pray in that God may fill you with the knowledge of his will through wisdom and understanding. This wrestling, wisdom means this wrestling through things. I'm not for sure how this works. It's, 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 it's labor. It's trying to figure things out. How, do, how, does, this, how, how does this work, God? Where, how do I live this life? We, again, we know. We know 95% of what God wants. But wisdom is, I love this from, from um, McKnight, he says, wisdom is learning how to live in God's world, in God's way, with an emphasis on discernment for a well-ordered life. That's what wisdom is. And I love this. This is another, another of Paul's prayer. Paul is praying for the Philippian church, and he says something similar to the, to the fact. He says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may know, so that you may be able to discern what is best. That's wisdom, right? That your knowledge may be filled, uh, you may be filled with a, uh, overflowing with this love, not not, uh, not reputation, um, not prestige, not anything like that, but a revenge, those are horrible motivations, but we may be filled with love, authentic, authentic love, so that we may be able to discern, so we may be able to weigh what is the best option here. How do we proceed? How do we live out this faith, this life? How do we live a life worthy of the Lord? And that's exactly what the, the sort of the core of this message of what Paul's message is. Verse 10, so that you may live this life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. The purpose of knowing the will of God and wisdom is so that they may live this life, this kind of life, to live a life worthy. To live in the Greek here is the word peripateo. I put it in two different words because um, my son, uh, Zach, did a, um, a teaching series for some youth and he, uh, he and his associates, they, she drew um, these little cartoon uh, um, frames that described every week as they were talking about what it meant to live or walk peripateo. Perry was a young man, a little junior high boy, uh, trying to figure out how to walk in the way of God. Peripateo can be translated life or to live or to walk or journey. And so this idea to live or to walk in a way worthy of the Lord Ah, it's, it's something to think about. This life, and I, I think about life. Just stop there for a second. Life is awesome. I mean, when I think about, humor me for a second here, I, I, I like to think grandiose and, and small details beyond where we live right now. I, I'm just, I just, I love thinking about space, and I love thinking about that we're on this big blue well, really small blue planet that flies, spins around at 1,500 miles an hour and flies around the sun at 65,000 miles an hour. And, and the sun itself and our solar system is traveling in the Milky Way at 265,000 miles an hour. 
mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, earth is just saying, wait for me, right? So just, just chasing earth or chasing the sun in its orbit. And not only that, the Milky Way is in a larger, <laughs> a larger set of galaxies that are also traveling and spinning. And, and we have the ability to see far, far into the outer space. And we see out to our farthest points called the observable, the end of the observable universe. And we're in the middle of all this. Well, maybe not in the middle. What is middle in the middle of space? I mean, where is that, right? And it's expanding. They've sent out the James Webb telescope. It's not quite yet fully functional. It's getting close where it's going to be able to really pinpoint and see farther into where we've ever seen before. Now, I've, I've always been asking this question. I always think, you know, the earth or the space is, space is expanding. Always, they, they always say it's, it's expanding. And, and from the Big Bang, from expanding out. And God said, let there be light, and just explodes out, right? And I always ask, what's it expanding into? Then I thought about this. Maybe it's not expanding into anything. Maybe we're only seeing the edge. Maybe there's no edge, <laughs> which that just causes me to go, what? We may never really see the edge. And yet, here we are in Street of Illinois. Life is awesome. I'm conscious, I'm aware. You are aware. You see me, I see you, you hear me, I hear you. We can communicate and we move and breathe and we laugh and we cry and we decide. And if we're lucky to have 70, 80, 90 years on this life, what majesty is that? <laughs> to live a life worthy of the Lord. And may we please him in every way. I'm humbled by the fact that we're even on this planet, that we can even speak about this. And that's not even to talk about when you go really, really small into atoms and protons and quarks and string and blah. What? It's crazy. That we may live that we may walk, we may peripateo this life in a way that honors God, that we may please him in every way. That's what the gospel produces. That's what it means when Jesus said, as he was going around in Galilee, declaring that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that was the good news, that the king has come. And this is really important for the Jews, because remember, the Jews were thinking it was going to be a kingdom like David's king, kingship. God created the world. He was king. And then the people, the Israelites, were like, we want a king like everybody else around us. You don't want a king, God says. No, we really want a king. No, you don't. You really don't. No, we really, really do. Okay, fine. You've got a king. And they're like, oh, we don't want a king anymore. <laughs> Saul was horrible. And David rose up. God rose David up, a little scrawny little boy that was out tending to his father's sheep with stones and throwing them, hitting lions and tigers and bears and protecting the sheep. And then there were horrible kings, and they got taken away. And the grand story from creation to kingdom is this. God created the world. He is king over all, and yet you want a king and do it your own way. And yet Jesus has come, and he is king. That's the good news. God has come down and lived a while among us. That's what it means to walk in this way. So what does it look like to... Live a life worthy of the Lord. Well, Paul sort of addresses this in, bre in brevity here a little bit, but he looks at four different things. I'll read the text here, and then we'll sort of break this down. It says, bearing fruit in every good work. A, a life lived worthily and pleasing the Lord looks like this. To bear fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience in giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Let's look at each of those four, specifically 
bearing fruit in every good work. A life well lived is one that produces something. We're on this huge planet flying through space. It's a miracle that we're alive. Seriously, it's a miracle. It's amazing that we're alive. How does two little cells come together and become a life to grow and to become aware and conscious? My little grandson is now just trying to figure this stuff out. He's eight months old. He's sitting up, not crawling, but doing an incredibly good moon crawl backwards. He's pretty fast at that. He'll get the other parts later. My little granddaughter is almost four. She's figuring things out. It's fun to see the light bulbs go off. And as we get older at 12 and 13 and 16 and 20 and become older adults, and I skip middle age, middle adults and then older adults, and we realize how awesome this life is that, that we're doing something. What, that there's a purpose to how... What's the point of all of it? To live a life worthy of this majesty that we're experiencing that we often don't pay attention to. When I think about bearing fruit, I mean, honestly, I always go back to John 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it'll be even more fruitful. In other words, the point of a branch is to bear fruit. The point of living life is to do something with it, to live. No man, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then Galatians 5 is all about the fruit, right? We've, <laughs> we sing this to little kids. I remember VBS is here. We had the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, I remember, you know, songs we'd sing, we'd teach. It's just so prevalent. It's so much a part. What does it mean to bear fruit? What does it mean to live life? What does it mean to live a life worthy of the Lord? I think it does sort of capture it in these nine. These aren't the only nine. It's just some of the nine. But these are some of the things that John, or that Paul talks about as he wrote to the Galatians. That the Spirit produces love. Ha, that's awesome, right? I mean, love is the cornerstone of everything. And to have joy and, and peace in the midst of difficulties. Forbearance is just what we used to call patience. It just seems to be a little bit more like forbearance is, is withholding, is not doing something you want to do. And I've told you the story before of how difficult it is for me at the McDonald's drive-thru. It's just hard for me not to honk when people pass me in a obviously one-lane kind of a situation that divides off later, okay? I mean, I just, I'm still not over that kind of stuff. Just, I just have to walk in. I just can't handle it. So for me to, forbearance, don't say anything, quit, don't, uh, but yeah, that's the one I usually fail on. Kindness, being kind and good and faithful and gentle and having self-control. This is the kind of stuff that's produced. That's what Paul said, to live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. There's, there's going to be some evidence. Are we, are we becoming more like Jesus, right? I mean, are we growing in that kind of a thing? Because Man, 80 years is pretty short on this grand scale. And might as well live with some kind of purpose. The second thing he talks about is just growing in the knowledge of God. Knowledge of God should always be translated into living for God. If we know God, then there ought to be some growth to that. What's it do for us in a day-to-day -day kind of thing? Away from the church building. This isn't really Christianity. This Sunday morning thing is not Christianity. Yes, it is. It doesn't completely, totally compens or, uh, encapsulate it. It's, it's how we live all the time. It's, it's how we live out the gospel that we're gospeling through life that we're declaring that the kingdom of heaven is here by the way we live, that there's growing in the Lord, and we grow by, by spending time thinking about God, thinking about deep, deep thoughts about God, and praying, even simple prayers, and seeking to understand the nature of God, which is really hard in its, of itself. This omniscient, all-knowing, this, this omnipresent, omnip, omnipotent 
God, how in the world? What's interesting, Jesus says, and we'll talk about this next time uh, I preach. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Thinking about what that looks like, the nature of God. It's hard to figure out who who God is, but we can see Jesus and see how he loved and how he had joy and how he had peace and how he lived a life worthy of the Lord. And there's, man, what a great calling to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. The Colossians, they need to learn this because Paul's concern, remember he's concerned these Gentile believers. There's a concern. We're not really for sure exactly what the concern is. It, it, we sometimes just sort of call it the Colossian heresy. Um, some people think it may be some kind of form of a Gnosticism, a special knowledge that some agitators, some people outside the community, maybe sometimes, maybe they're a part of the, of the Christian community there in Colossae, but they're trying to derail these Gentile believers. It, it most definitely has Jewish roots to it because they're throwing all these Jewish kind of things like, hey, you got to get in line and go through Moses and Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets. You've you, you got to go through that kind of like, here's the problem. Gentile believers, the Gentiles in this church, they don't have in their storybook, in their story of history of their lives, they don't have chapter one that includes any of that. <laughs> they are not a part of the chosen family, according to the Israelites. They are not a part. They're on the outside of that. They are, they are not a part of God's people until the kingdom comes, until Jesus comes and allows them to be a part of that. And so Paul, is, he's concerned. He's excited about their faith from a papyrus, but boy, he's also concerned, which leads to this next one. He says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so you may have great endurance and patience to put up with these folks. I love the picture there. I mean, that's what life is sometimes. You're just, just trying to make it through. Sometimes life is hard. I used the word stick to itness in my last uh, series, that was the last sermon of the First Peter series. I love that word, stick to itness, just hanging in there, that perseverance that, that we have to have to be faithful. And then finally, what Paul is mentioning about what it looks like to live a, a life well lived, to live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, includes living with an attitude of joyful thanks. I love that picture. Give me that next picture there, if you would. Next slide. Gratitude is the best attitude. I like that. How grateful to live with thankfulness, to be grateful for what he has done, that he has qualified us and these Gentile believers at Colossae to, to share in the inheritance. How grateful are you? I mean, today's a great day to be thankful, right? Thankful for our moms, thankful for our grandmas, thankful for those kind of people who stood in our lives. I think about my mom. I posted something on Facebook this morning. I was just thinking about my mom, Charlotte. When I say that I was horrible to her, that is not an understatement. My mom was uh, 39 when she, when she got married to my dad, 41 when I, when I was born. I recall being probably six or seven, running through the old back door of our farmhouse, running away from her, her screaming at the top of her lungs with a yardstick, and me running around the outhouse and, and the chicken coop. And at six and seven, I grabbed it, that yardstick and broke it over my knee and ran off again. And I recall as I got older, as I was getting older, I was getting taller and bigger. My mom was 5'3". My dad was 5'6". I'm not really sure where I came from at 6'2", but <laughs> I remember her coming into my room one time and she was getting after me for something. I was horrible to her for the first 15 years of my life. I was probably good at two, but, well, terrible twos and threes, probably not. So maybe four. <laughs> at 12, I remember picking her up when she was getting after me and put her in her room and locked it and shut the door. I was ruthless. I'm thankful for her. She took me to the minister, our minister. She took me to our principal a couple times just to try to get any help to deal with this kid who is way bigger, more powerful, just 
ruthless, and yet, man, I'm thankful for her. To live a life of thanks, of gratitude, wow. Maybe you haven't been. Maybe today, Mother's Day, what a great day. Maybe your mom's gone. Maybe, like my mom is, she's been gone for years, a couple decades. But you can honor her by just simply being grateful. I think that's what it means to live a life well lived, to, to live with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, to, to be able to grow in understanding of God and the world. It's so much bigger and deeper and to figure out how we fit in all this. We're not just accidents. If we're not just accidents, there must be something going on that we got to pay attention to. <clears throat> to live this life with great endurance and with thanks, thankfulness. Ah. To please God simply involves all four of these things, I think. And Paul just sort of nails it. He wasn't trying to spit out four little concepts, four pictures that we have in our mindset. But these four pictures, I think, give us at least a glimpse of what it means to live a life worthy of the Lord. And then going on with verse 12, picking up that joyful thanks. Verse 12 says, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Notice that word qualified. Were the Gentile believers at this church, were they qualified? Not at all. (laughs) Not in the grand scheme of things. They weren't part of the story. From Adam, from Abraham, from Moses, to David, to the prophets, they were not included. I mean, on the day of Pentecost, it was the Jews who accepted Jesus on that day, the 3,000 men who were added that day. And at Acts 6, when they were working, you know, trying to figure out how to serve everybody, they had some Grecian Jews, they had some Gentiles in there, but they still weren't getting it until Paul or till Peter in Acts 10, like 10 years after, 10 years after the, uh, the day of Pentecost experience, these Gentiles weren't included, and these Jews had a hard time getting in their brain that they were, the Gentiles were qualified? Oh my, no, <laughs> it's just for us Jews. And Paul is writing to these Gentiles, and they would have been listening to this and hearing Thanks to the Father who has qualified all of us are Gentiles. Probably, I don't know, there may be some Jewish heritage here. But that joyful giving thanks who has qualified you, notice this, he's qualified you all, you, you Colossians, to share in the inheritance. Another word, an inheritance in his holy people. Inheritance? <laughs> Gentiles wouldn't be included in the inheritance. Inheritance is language from the Old Testament when when the inheritance were passed out to the 12 tribes of Israel. Gentiles weren't allowed at the reading of the will. But no, 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 they're included now. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the part that is just so cool that that Jesus ushers in that, that all are accepted to be able to come and be welcomed into God's kingdom. To live a life worthy of the Lord that these believers were qualified to share in. It was holy people, that word holy people, hagios, right? Hagios is saints into the kingdom of the light. Now, I've underlined kingdom and dominion. Those two words aren't in the original Greek. That's what translator, or, uh, interpreters have to do, translators have to do, um, trying to figure out what's the, what's the idea is being said here. I mean, uh, all of us communicate this way. We have an idea in our brain. We just hook it to a vehicle. The vehicle is a word, and we send it out. And sometimes that's the wrong vehicle. We have to try to get back, but you can't, right? You know, oh, didn't mean to say that. Bring that back in, right? It's the idea that we try to convey. The idea that we're trying to convey and what, what is going on here, it's really translated this, that who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. And yet the translators, the interpreters uh, who are making the translations Realize what's going on, that there is this movement from the past into the present. For he has rescued us from darkness and brought us into the kingdom. So because we're moving into the kingdom, they sort of have added these two words to help us to better understand that we're moving from one kingdom or one domain into another domain. How cool is that? In whom we have redemption or 
we've been paid for. We have forgiveness of sin. We stand right before God. How awesome is that? How thankful that is that we are a part of God's upside down kingdom, an upside down kingdom where King Jesus is here and we're living our eternal life. It's an upside down kingdom because Jesus, he didn't do things exactly the way the old covenant talked about. He said, you heard that it was said in the old covenant, but I tell you this, love your enemies. What? No, 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 no. You heard that it was said, do this. And I say, what? And I know I've mentioned this I think a couple of sermons ago, I don't remember when it was, but remember that time when James and John, or mother of James and John, that's even worse, right? When James and John were trying to get to be the first and second in the kingdom, and when it comes in with all the authority, and Jesus is going to take off and go, and James and John wanted to be there, and Jesus says, if you want to be great, <laughs> you'll be a servant. What? Upside down, flip it upside down. No, no, greatness is serving people. It's living a life well-lived. It's a living a life worthy and pleasing him in every way is putting people first. It's loving. It's being joyful. It's being gentle and being faithful. That's what it means to please. That's what it means to live a life worthy of the Lord, that we live out this gospel, that we go forth gospeling which leads to being bearing the fruit of the Spirit and what ultimately means being rooted. <laughs> being firmly rooted. And that's Paul's biggest prayer. He wants to hear these young Gentile believers, this young, fragile faith group of followers of Jesus to be able to stand firm and endure the challenges that we'll learn about a little bit later. We please someone we love. We please our moms, we please our dads, because we love them, right? I didn't love my mom, I guess, very well when I was a kid. I was just a kid, right? But ruthless to her. But we love God when we understand his grace and we can live it in a way that we can please him in everything we do. Christianity isn't a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's not a bunch of checklists. It's just simply peripateoing with Jesus in the daily details of our lives. So I've got a couple questions for you. How often is it your conscious goal to please God in all you say and do to say I love you with your life? It takes practice. It really does. We don't see God right physically before us, so it's sometimes hard. We have to consciously focus in. Secondly, how is your exercise of wisdom going to discerning what is best, to weighing things out, to choosing to live this wonderful, incredible, amazing life with a purpose? And what specific action can you take to improve a living, to living a life worthy as a saint rooted in the kingdom of God, that you may bear fruit in your conduct and character, that you may grow in knowledge of God, to know him more, that you may be strengthened to have endurance and patience, and maybe simply every day to live with a joyful thanks and gratitude. And maybe that could start by practicing, by just being thankful to our moms that we may please God. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you for what it means to live this life on this huge, in this huge space with this little tiny ball. It's amazing. As we go about our day, may you help us however that works. May you help us to be conscious the decisions we make to honor you. May your spirit nudge us. God, we want to please you because we love you and we are grateful for life. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we prepare for a time of communion today.